You're tuned into Life is a Sacred Journey. Every week, we bring a new perspective to aging and caregiving. Here is your host, Michelle Pope. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the virtual neighborhood of Life is a Sacred Journey. It is my honor and privilege to be with you this morning here. We are you know, a platform that talks a lot about caregiving and other challenges of women, because women are the number one and and end up being the uh, number one caregivers of our aged and, you know, folks that need caregiving. And we know that the road for women in the workforce and the, you know, just everything has been a little different than it has been for their counterparts. And one of the areas that I have been doing a lot of research on under my social justice consciousness is the violence against women. We have an act, the Violence Against Women Act. Um, I will give you the 1-800 number as we get into the conversation with our guests this morning. But there's domestic violence, there's financial violence, these, there's now these what they call romance scams where women are being violated for their income and, and made to think that they have finally met the person of their dreams. And so today we will be um, having a discussion with two people who I am really excited about having them here. I'm going to make sure I can bring them in from the virtual neighborhood here. Laura, I I believe it's from Bach, and Joy Farrow. And they are amazing women. Their book is coming out on October 3rd, 2023. You can begin to order it, get it, all of those kinds of things. But let me tell you a little bit about them because I think you need to know who they are. And then we'll delve into this. As I said, you know, this is near and dear to my heart, siblings out there in the world. One, because I'm a mother of a daughter. I am a woman myself and travel by myself and do a lot of things by myself because I like to. (laughs) But there is always something that you have to consider when you do that. And I'll tell you a story and then we'll listen to it from Joy and Laura. We'll ask some questions and get them involved. So Joy is a retired deputy sheriff with 28 years of experience. And she's worked on the road patrol. And I love the name of this. I I always get this wrong because pronunciation is like the worst thing that I have. It's Pompana. Pompano. Pompano Beach. Pompano Beach. (laughs) It's like one of those words, right? (laughs) Um, Pompano Beach, Florida, and has faced really um, in her service, because I think anyone that does this kind of work is in service, right? All of us are in service and seen some unimaginable things. Some of us are aware of it because we watch movies and television, but we've never been touched by it, truly. And after 9-11 tragedy, Joy transferred to the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport with the Broward. Broward. Broward, going to help me, Sheriff's Office to focus <laughs> on the safety of air travelers, which, you know, again, as a as a scary uh, air person, I really am needing somebody like Joy in my life and has assisted in many things, shootings in airports, believe it or not, it happens and just has received a lot of awards. She's been featured on TED Talk. You can find her. Let's talk about Laura Frombach, was introduced to technology in the U.S. Army working on Pershing uh, nuclear missiles. Don't you love this? Like, you know, that's like when I, I saw that movie where the women had done, the Black women had done the numbers and all of that. Yes. You know, yes. you begin to realize that women have impacted the whole world all the time, you know. Hidden so, figures. Love it. Hidden yeah, figures. That's love it. it. Yes. And she spent her career as a technologist and engineer with IBM, FedEx, Coca-Cola, and different organizations. You can get her bio on and they'll tell you where. A turning point in Laura's life, meaning an aha moment. And you know, you can see I love these women already because that's my favorite, one of my favorite mantras. What's your aha moment? Uh, When she correlated her mother's mental illness to domestic violence. And she advocates for local domestic violence shelters. And she too, has been on TEDx and their book that's coming out, I'm gonna fold this down so you can see, I made a picture of it, okay? Um, Street Smart, let me, I'm crooked. 
There we go. Street Smart Safety for Women, Your Guide to Defensive Living. And you can get it, um, pre-order it, and it'll be out October 3rd. Ladies, let me just say this to you. Recently, I bought a refrigerator. And for the first time, because normally my children were home, my son, and there was activity in my home. So I haven't purchased anything where anybody had to come into my home with me there alone. I also, I have dogs, of course, and, and I know my dogs will protect me, but there was still a, a level of concern that I had midday that I was going to be alone and these delivery people were gonna bring my refrigerator and my neighborhood, I live in a bedroom community. So a lot of people were gone to work. It was during the week. And I began to get really nervous as, as, and, and started to feel a little anxiety. So I opened the garage door, I opened the back door, I opened the front door wide so that while they were there, I had access out of my house because I had to put the dogs away, right? Because wow. they, they tell you that they like, you know, because one of them would have bit them, but but I had I had exit points. And I'm gonna say this to people, and and again, I always say disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. I'm not telling you that you need to do this. I'm just telling sharing my life experience. And I also have a taser, okay? Um and I use that when I travel on the back roads of California because I visit churches in long story, so I won't go into there. But I had my taser in my apron. I had an apron on because I had to clean the refrigerator out. So wow. all of that to say something, and they call it safety intuition, something about my intuition said, do this. It doesn't mean that I'm not a loving, caring person. Everybody who knows me thinks that I probably am that to a fault. But I did not want to be a victim. And, and the gentlemen were fantastic. They were loving, they were caring. I, I gave them water, it was great. But it's only because I felt safe. So Joy and Laura, welcome to Life is a Sacred Journey. It is such a pleasure to have you here to talk about something again that is near and dear to my heart. I work with young women that have been sex trafficked after they are taken away from that situation and the violence that they tell me that they experience is an abomination mm -hmm. to the humanity. And then the other is I'm one of those people that watches all those shows. I'm <laughs> I hate to tell you, I'm one of them. <laughs> and, and women are vulnerable in so many ways. Romance scams, when you're traveling alone and you want to pull into an area in a rest stop, you have to be super vigilant about that. Sometimes you have to pass one because it looks unsafe. And you talk about safety intuition. And I want you to talk about your book, what brought you to the book, each of you. And then, um, you know, talk about that safety intuition, because I think we're, we're, we're wanting to be politically correct. Yes, there are people out there that victimize other people because of their color and all of those things, right? And that happens every day in the naked city. But women, regardless of color and culture or anything, are still, from what I read, four times more likely to be killed or be a victim of somebody else's anger, hatred, or mental illness. So can you bring us in and welcome to Life is a Sacred Journey. It's so good to meet you this morning. Michelle, thank you so much for having us. Thank you. And you are absolutely correct. Brava. We applaud your safety intuition. I love the taser in the apron. That's wonderful. And safety intuition is, well, first of all, let me just tell you the scope of violence. Yeah, would you, yeah, yeah. kind of tell us and bring us. Right. So, so let's map this out a little bit. Yeah. And, and first of all, you know, thank you so much also for your service to survivors. Um, really heartrending, but, you know, thank you. And, but, and necessary. but necessary. Yes, and necessary. Yes. Violence against women is so horrific that the World Health Organization estimates that one in three women globally 
irrespective of culture, irrespective of nature, whatever, um, of uh, nationality, one in three women globally are the victim of physical or sexual violence at least once in their life. And there are many women, as you know, who are victims multiple times. These statistics are horrific. And, you know, if this was not so prevalent and so ancient, truly, you know, everybody would be up in arms and having a law enforcement task force to find out why all of these people are being victimized. But we have just become so used to it yeah. that, you know, it's just business as usual. And, and we, quite frankly, think that's unacceptable. Mm-hmm. So to move on to safety intuition, safety intuition is our natural instinct. It is our natural birthright. And it has been ours ever since our ancestors walked the savannah. It is simply our five senses picking up things our conscious mind can't even fathom and reporting that information back to our conscious mind. Mm -hmm. And what makes it so frightening for women is that we as women globally have been so conditioned to listen to everybody else besides ourselves, including strangers on the street, that we don't listen to our own natural instincts. Mm -hmm. So if some we're walking along, let's say, and somebody could be man or woman, anybody really walks up to us and says, hello, can you help me? Excuse me, miss. Instinctively, 99% of us will say, just turn and look at them. And a man we just keep walking or just, you know, wave his hand. But we want to instinctively, women do not want to leave anyone in peril. So we will at least stop for and hesitate for a moment. Mm-hmm. And if our safety intuition, like the hair on the back of your neck or, you know, the pit uh, feeling in the pit of your stomach, or just like you said, you know, a feeling that something could be wrong occurs we minimize it to ourselves. We don't listen. And we say, oh, it's probably nothing. So imagine what our ancestors on the savannah would have done if there was a predator. Well, they have the same instincts we did, only they paid attention. Oh, a tiger. We <laughs> minimize that. Now, what would, would have happened to our ancestors if they said, oh, you know what? That tiger's probably nothing. I'm just going to keep going. We wouldn't be here right now. True so enough. safety intuition is simply our unconscious mind, our body responding, sending the information to our unconscious that pumps it up through our brain. And we say, thanks for that. I'm going to ignore you because I have to be polite. Mm-hmm. And Joy, you ran into this time after time when you were on the street. Yes. A lot of times right. at work, I needed to use safety intuition for my job. Yes, yes. You know, you couldn't tell if people were lying because, well, they did all the time. So you had to have a a second sense and you had to have a feeling. Mm-hmm. What are they hiding? What are they not telling you? What um, facial expressions yes. are they trying to hide that you know, is going to preclude something they're about to do to you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are little things that I needed to watch in milliseconds before something was going to happen because they would say one thing and then pull out a weapon out of their pocket in a second. So you needed to put all these things together while you're thinking and talking to them. Yeah. And these are things that, you know, women don't think of just because you have so many things to do in your day and you're busy, business women, you know, young people, you're on the way, you're on your phone, you got things to do. And you're not thinking this person is a problem. But a lot of times lately, they are. Yeah. And they don't look like a problem. And that I think is what is deceiving to women. And a lot of our friends and Mm -hmm. neighbors that we've talked to over the years. And even when I was working, people, you know, women would say, oh, 
I know I should have known. I told myself, I don't know why I did that. I shouldn't have talked to him. I shouldn't have gone out with him. I don't know why I did. I, I got a bad feeling. Yeah. And I went against it a, a lot of times. And the thing is, I think it starts, uh, Laura and Joy, Joy, when we are young. One of the things I did not do, and I don't know um, if you agree and you can speak to this, um, when my children were young and they would, you know, stranger danger. And my comment to them always, even if they were people that were a part of our chosen family inner circle, I would say to them, as long as mommy is present and I can see you and you can see me, you can feel your, the, I gave them a larger personal space that they could navigate and, and feel safe. But I said, if you look up and you don't see me, then that means you need to get to me and I'll be looking for you as well. So that way they would always feel that they were safe and that strangers, because not every stranger is a bad person, right? But, right. but that strangers can be let in, but in a gradual kind of way and not Absolutely. just, I never forced them to hug people that they didn't want to hug. Right. I never um, made them speak to people that they didn't want to speak to. Um, mm -hmm. I, would, I would let them stand next to me and I would say, well, you can stand next to me and say hello. You know, mm -hmm. so so I think that I mean, I mean, I want to hear your insight on that. I think that if we could teach that also to parents um, in train in in training, because it is training, a part of parenting is training, training the young person up so that as a woman, we don't feel like we're always the ones that have to be the comforters to everyone, one that and that we can discern. Yeah, the like, level of comfort that we want to give and that we're not we're not being asked to give every iota of ourselves. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And uh, a lot of young people, sometimes children, that's a sign of they're getting a bad feeling from that person. Yes. So Absolutely. whether it's a relative or not, whatever it is, there's a feeling maybe until they get comfortable with them. And it might be that nothing has happened. They don't know them. That's but, right. But, you know, as, as time goes on, you know, if they get a little older and they they have some feeling and you're like, well, what, what's wrong? If they don't feel comfortable with that person, you, you have to open that avenue to be able to talk to them and say, if anything ever happens, you can tell me. I yeah. don't care who it is. It's not your fault. That's right. So whatever happens, you know, whether it's a teacher, a family member, whoever it is, nobody, you know, should touch you, a stranger, anybody, but especially people that you know. And it's usually friends of the family, the closest people, relatives, cousins that um, children and, you know, as they get into their 20s or you know sometimes even a little older yeah. things happen and people feel embarrassed yeah. and they don't want to say anything and they really should because they're like well you're going to think it's my fault that's a cousin it's your brother it's somebody but you know if you instill that early on that that's not your fault you can always tell us you know we'll believe you and and Laura, when when you think about that and 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 think about women as we've grown into our womanhood and we begin to experience the world and and um, you know I've heard people say, well, she provoked me. Um, if it's domestic violence or even um, in rape, I, I I you know I've heard people say, well, she seduced me with the outfit she had on. Things that that make women feel guilty for who they are and their expression. You know, I may not wear um, an outfit that is 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 exposing as much of myself, but that doesn't mean because somebody else has an outfit like that, that they're saying victimize me, right? So where do we get all these negative messages about women? I'm going to go back to what you said, Michelle, about discernment. Okay. And so we as women are expected to care for the world. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. the, 
on our shoulders, no matter who that person is to care for them. And so, you know, we can be good people and we can care. And, you know, I'm a caring person. Joy's a caring person. We're both nice people. We were brought up to be nice people. It doesn't mean we're not nice people, but we can be caring and also, you know, have boundaries and, and stand strong as well. Yeah. And so to to extend that into what women wear and what women do and, you know, the defense of an attacker or a perpetrator that says she made me do it, whether it's domestic violence or rape or whatever type of victimization yeah. of women there is. Let's extend that a little further. And, you know, that perpetrator would not snap at their boss. <laughs> they would not snap. It's somebody that they perceive as having power over them. So when they snap or, you know, oh, my gosh, you know, my mind just went blank. That's a load of crap um, because they would not snap at somebody who was held in that they held perceived and having power over them. But would they snap at women for what again, whether it's rape or or you know, domestic violence, whatever it is, it's because they believe they can get away with it. They believe that the victim does not hold or should not hold the same amount of personal power that they do. And unfortunately, you know that as well as we do, unfortunately, they believe they can get away with it. And too many times they're right. Yes. They believe they would be held to account, like if they attacked their boss or their neighbor or whomever else, if they knew they would be held to account and there would be consequences, they would not go to the lengths that they do to victimize. So and that, he, how, oh, go ahead, George. Oh, oh I, I was just going to say, you know, also you'll notice in a lot of domestic violence situations is people will say, I, I never saw that in him. Yes. Especially yes. Family or friends or people at work to see on the news, especially if there was a murder. They're shocked. It, it, it could never have been him. Well, there's two personas. There's the happy work one or, you know, the going out with the friends and the family. But as soon as that door closes at home, You know, like they say, you don't know what goes on behind there. And that's why, you know, when women try to say or children, hey, this is what's happening at home. Oh, that it couldn't be. He he's such a nice guy at work. Because they want you to believe that. How else can this go on? How can they control the family until it gets to a point where the family is fighting back and the police are involved. And now, you know, it's a pressure cooker and that tends to be when it implodes. And well, and, and in your book, Street Smart Safety for Women, your guide to defensive living, for, take us through sort of the content of the book, what's in there and what might uh, readers get. And, and folks, please, um, it's Street Smart Safety for Women, your guide to defensive living. Felicia will put in, I always do like this because that's where it ends up, right? Um, Felicia will put in there a link so that you can access. But, you know, I think this is a book that you should buy multiple copies of. You know how I always tell you uh, books that I read, I buy multiple copies when after I read them. So and keep them in the trunk of my car. And then somebody I meet along the way or some conversation and I go here. So or send it to your granddaughter that's going to college or somebody who's moving into an apartment, a woman that's moving in into apartment building for their first time. So I'm going to uh, let Joy and Laura tell us a little bit about the content of the book. But please, you know, this is really important because you deserve to enjoy your life. And if you do not feel safe, then you're walking around in fear. And fear is, is like taking a, a noose, and I hate the analogy, you know I do, but, but it is like that, like putting your own hands around your neck and, and preventing you from living your life to the fullest. And so tell us what's in the book. Tell us how this book can help us to learn and to acknowledge some of the, the pitfalls of, of the street, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. 
Well, Joy and I both have experience in different areas. Joy, of course, with her law enforcement background and my background with technology and family violence. What we wanted to do was combine our experience into one book to share with women our experience of of every aspect of women's safety that we could think of to share our experience in the hope that people, not only women, other, you know, everyone can take advantage of this, but we specifically cover safety from the perspective of women, the emotional and, and mental aspects. So we wanted to combine everything into one book. We talk about a defensive living strategy because defensive living, we believe, is like defensive driving. You get into your car with a few strategies and rules and a lot of confidence. You drive along every day. You are not terrified to drive. You pass thousands of other vehicles. A lot of people are not paying attention. They're putting their makeup on. They're watching even videos sometimes yes. <laughs> doing things, but they are not terrified. They're driving along with confidence because they know the rules. They know some strategies. And we want that same confidence to extend to women in their daily lives. So we started with the defensive living strategy. We talk about safety and tuition, as we mentioned. We also believe that an important strategy for women is to be persuasion proof. When men are asked something, hey, can you do something for me? And the man says no. That's the end of the discussion, isn't it? He just said no. All right, that's it. We're going to go on our way. When a woman says no, That's the beginning of the persuasion process. Oh, we have to change her mind because we as a society are not accustomed to women saying no. So we talk about that. We talk about women being pressured in in the stages of that. Women being pressured to change their mind because somebody wants something from them. Mm -hmm. Whatever that something may be, it may be as simple as, hey, can you give me a hand over here to, hey, come over here for a minute and get in my car. You know, there's a huge gamut, but women are expected to comply, whether it's men or other women. We talk about um, sham scams and cons. You know, that is a huge huge issue in our society, especially with the advent of social media and technology, and how predators no longer need physical access to victims. They can do it, you know, electronically. We also talk about dating, which is so important for young women, and how we want young women to understand that domestic violence and abuse does not exist in a vacuum. These are patterns, and those patterns are established during the dating process. So we want women of all ages, of course, but particularly younger women who may not have a lot of experience in in dating, to understand patterns like love bombing on the first date when their date, you know, comes on strong and it's a whirlwind romance. I mean, that's what we're sold as part of the American dream. Yeah, right? we are. I was just getting ready yeah. to say, isn't that every movie that we've ever right. seen? Right. So think La La Land, Pretty Woman, all of that. You know, oh, it's a whirlwind romance. Finally, somebody appreciates and loves me. But that's the hook or that's the first step, actually, in the process of domestic violence, because that's the emotional hook. You know, we fall in love, somebody loves me and appreciates me. And once that hook has been established, the abuser knows that they can control the victim. And it may or may not be conscious. It may just be the way the perpetrator is or has been raised or their personality, whatever. But we describe some personality traits that women can look for that say, oh, you know what? I'm being love bombed. Oh, you know what? These patterns of domination and control are being established early in the dating pattern. And the sooner you leave, the much easier it will be. We talk about that. We talk about women and weapons. And, you know, guns aren't the only option. They're an option if that's what you want. But, you know, they're not for everybody. And we discuss that. And we don't have Uh, We don't have any opinion about that for other people. Right, right, right. 
But Joy talks about that, you know, from her experience in law enforcement. And then we conclude also with um, Joy going into some ways that she leads her daily life. And I'm also going to add that we talk about how to recover from trauma. That we believe that every person on this planet has been traumatized in some way, shape, or form. I mean, it's a traumatic society that we live in. But women in particular, we ourselves have done a lot of trauma work. And that because you have been traumatized, it's not a death sentence. Please don't be ashamed. Please seek help. There is not only life after trauma. But there's post-traumatic growth and that you can grow from being traumatized and still live your life as a whole person. And that's our hope for you. Mm -hmm. Wow. So love bombing, um, traumatic trauma. And, you know, we we um, have a lot of guests here that speak about caregiving. and, And you're making me think that also this is a great book for um, caregivers because um, I work in, we work in the field of dementia, mental health. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, our caregivers will report that there's been verbal violence or physical violence by the person that they're they're caring for. And so this too, when you're talking about trauma, taking care of your own personal trauma will help you to be more resilient uh, because we already know this person is, doesn't have the capability to modulate any of this, but because of trauma un, undiagnosed and untreated um, in, in probably a hundred percent of the society, we react to things in a way that actually creates more abuse across the board. Um, mm-hmm. is, is that true or false? Because I, I just pulled that out of my head. <laughs> I'm going to jump in again. I'm not trying to exclude Joy. No, no, no. But I want to share something that I learned a long time ago that helped me in my trauma recovery. And somebody I was talking to said, where would you say that you lived um, in, a, in a, is a state of anxiety on a daily basis on a scale of one to 10? And I said, probably an eight. And he said, What would you say if I said that most people who are not traumatized or, you know, haven't been radically traumatized, live on a level of a two or three? And I was stunned because I could not imagine living, you know, life with, you know, that huge gap of anxiety. And so I made it my mission to to do the work and to to bring my level of anxiety down. I'm never going to live at a two or a three, but I can live at a four. Yeah. And so when you talk about trauma and especially, you know, untreated or un- unresolved trauma, perhaps a lot of people who have that, you know, they're living at that eight. And so it just takes the smallest little bit to you know, for them to to top out every day. It could be another driver. It could be, you know, somebody, you know, cutting in front of you at the grocery store, whatever. And But you have no headroom with which right. to navigate. Uh-huh. And so that's why we encourage people, whatever you can do, self-help groups, therapy, friends, community, community, community. is so important to yeah. recover from trauma and to self care for yourself and to love yourself because whatever happened, it wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. Joy, uh, before we run out of time, I want to ask you though, you know, recently I've seen more and more um, as women are traveling and getting into the world, particularly older women who have outlived yeah. their partner or uh, aged out, you know, aged out of a relationship. And I don't mean by, uh, chronological chronological age mm-hmm. but aging meaning the relationship just outlived itself mm-hmm. um, and they're traveling and they're doing things I mean going into a hotel uh, provides a certain amount of safety for individuals Airbnbs a little less because you never know what you're going to get when you get there and 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 you never know so mm-hmm. what are some safety tips? Um, and maybe two or three that so because we want people that, to read the book as well, but that you would say to to women who are traveling, um, uh, whether it be here in the States or anywhere else on, on our wonderful global world. Well, what's good is and sometimes it depends where you're traveling, 
but um, I do travel with whether you're traveling by car. I do travel with a spray. So I use uh, spray or I use um, gels. Okay. Um, okay. Also, um, a pen is good. A tactical pen is one of my favorites. So it can break glass. Oh. It's a real pen. I fly with it. And you can use it as a weapon. So there's a little sharp end. It's very sleek. You can use it as a weapon. But pepper spray is one of my go-tos. Okay. And it comes in all different sizes. And you, could, you obviously can't put it in your carry-on. No. But it is good to keep with you if you're driving. Now, if you're flying and you get to a hotel, what's great is you can use wasp spray so it's good to have you can always go to just the nearby store 7-eleven anything and just get a little can of wasp spray just so you can have it in the room with you carry it in your purse in the hotel you never know who you're going to be stuck in the hallway with or yes. the elevator or walking to your car in the back of the hotel so you you always want to have at least something with you. 30 feet, hornet spray, wasp spray will go 30 feet, ensuring that they never get near you. I love that. I love that. And then just the basic stuff, right? Like don't walk up to your car without looking back and seeing if there's anyone behind you. I mean, I'm seeing that people surround one person will walk by the car and another will engage. And then the next thing, you know, um, I try to park my car um, that where it's not in between two vehicles where my car gets lost. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I stay in the store too long and the two the, the cars are gone. But but the little mm -hmm. things, right, Joy, you just have to look around and and figure out. Right. Like I have cataracts. So I absolutely you need a lot of women don't you're right. A lot of women don't use their peripheral vision. Yeah. Which is really one of my big things is out to here, just turning your head a little bit more, but you know, women actually forget about this is how much you can see without having to turn your whole body all the way around to see who's behind you oh, is okay. just a little bit more. And your ears can pick up the sound of somebody behind you, something creaking, maybe something opening. Those are little things that you want to pick up. So you want to be careful not to have your ear pods in, you know, all the time. Have them on transparency mode. So at least you can hear the tiniest thing. Maybe somebody is taking something out of the bag. Maybe they're opening a weapon. But it's the littlest things that you'd be able to hear. Did um, you hear that, people? If you uh, have young people in your life, I'm here near UC Berkeley, and all I see is pods and looking down. You are a victim even to the sidewalk coming up <laughs> okay, to a crack on the street. You're a victim to that. If yes. you are listening and you can't hear what's going on around you and you think that the sidewalk is a safe place, how many people have been hit by cars on the sidewalk? Look it up. A lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of our other big ones is you don't have to open your car window to talk to a stranger. Oh. And that's a big one. You don't have to open your car window. Talk through the window. Now, it sounds rude, but you know what? It's a safety feature. It takes a lot to break that window. And, of course, you'll see it coming. But yeah. Yeah. nobody can spray you. And, obviously, you're going to see a weapon coming. So you can always drive off. But once you open that gap, even a little bit to talk to them, Anybody could stick their hand in, they could spray, they can, it doesn't take much to grab and pull that window out from somebody who's strong. Goodness, I but never... those are things that women have to get conditioned, especially when you're traveling. Yeah. Because somebody's going to come up and ask you, and then you put your window down, and then there you are 
in this tiny little space. You don't have anywhere to go. Once they come in through the window, they'll push you over, take the car, and now you're a hostage. Yeah, yeah. And in the hotel, they have these, um, you know, they have the bar that goes over. But I um, have learned that they have these little block things that they, you can uh, travel uh, mm -hmm. add to it. But my son told me, he said, but mommy, if you don't have that, take the chair and stick it under the doorknob. So at least if somebody's coming in, you have a few minutes to don't get yourself you. acclimated to the fact that something's getting ready to happen. Is that, do you agree with that, Joy? <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And sometimes, you know, you, you don't have a chair that's big enough, but you know what? That's a great idea. Also, anything, even your luggage, so you can hear noise, anything that you could put in front of the door, I found that would cause, you know, noise. Nobody's going to yeah. be able to creak in. Also, I have found that there's like an alarm wedge that you can buy Amazon and that you can put it underneath the door. Okay. So it's going to send off a sonic sound. And of course, nobody is going to want to come in after that. You could travel with that. Very uh -huh. lightweight. It's about that big, very lightweight, made of plastic, but it has a sonic sound. So anything like that, those are little things they want to travel with too. You know, a little sonic that you could keep in your pocket. Okay. Nobody wants to be around something like that. And of course you could travel, you know, on a plane with it and stuff, but people are going to turn around. And that's another thing is you want to be loud. If anybody is bothering you, you want to be loud. Yep. You want to have people turn around, you know, get away from me loud. You know, no matter how old you are, especially older people, you want to yell, you know, get away from me. I don't know you. Mm -hmm. Let people know. So if you were in the parking lot of a hotel, I would turn around and say, hey, what's going on over there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I love that's something that people don't think though. of. Mm -hmm. I I love joy that you just said though, say, I don't know them. So that way too, that people know what they're walking into that, that, that might be around to help because yeah. you know sometimes people are afraid to get involved with domestic, might be domestic uh, right. or whatever, but Absolutely. man, that yeah. it, I'm going to ask you this also. Somebody said when my daughter was taking karate and, and um, that say fire, scream fire, fire instead of help because help has been desensitized and you need to, how, how do you feel about that? And that, and that could work, especially in a hotel oh, um, yes. or, or call a police. Sometimes all, oh, you know, it's what comes to mind for okay. people. And if you condition yourself to yell fire, especially in a closed a place like that, um, you know, uh, in a hotel or, yeah. or some place where you know people are going to hear you, back of a restaurant, something like that. Okay. Somebody's going to come out. Oh my gosh, a, a, a fire! But um, sometimes people are conditioned with help um, only because help tends to be used as a ploy sometimes That's by predators. Cool. People are like, "Help! Let me let me see." Oh, what kind of help, you know, but the best thing that you could always do, because you never know if it's a domestic or uh, you're a woman, uh, you know, are you just going to rush in there? You have two hands. What are you going to do? You're going to use your phone all the time and call 911 all the time. Somebody else help. I don't even know what's going on. Call 911 lady in a parking lot says help. That's right. all. And the police are on the way. 911. You right. know, you could always keep an eye on the person, go in a little closer, see maybe she fell. You know, so sometimes you just have to take a little look, but 911 all the time. You don't have to go. Somebody says, Can you can you help me? Which is a ploy of a lot of predators. Yeah, it is. Can you help me, miss? What are you gonna do as a woman? And I think that's what happens in the you know, woman's mind is. Women like to help. Oh, I can help. What are you going to do? Yeah. You know, with your hands, you're not a fireman. You're not a police with a baton. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. wow. So those are things, you know, to think before you get in there, get on your phone. You know, you don't want to get yourself hurt. You want to yeah. help somebody. 
That's right. That's right. The book, Street Smart Safety for Women, Your Guide to Defensive Living, uh, Joy Farrow and Laura Frombach, Frombach. Is I, I love. I'm gonna keep my little piece of paper till my book comes. I'm, on the other so. side is where I ordered it. <laughs> um, so that's why I'm not sharing. It has my credit card stuff on it. Um, none of us needs to be a victim. No. None of us. You know, when they say you're in the wrong place at the, you're in the wrong place at whatever wrong time or whatever. Maybe and maybe not. But at the end of the day, you have been born intuition with a safety intuition that may have been tarnished along the way. And Joe Far uh, Joy Farrow and Laura Frombach Bach are, are two people that came together and said, let's do a book. They put stuff in it that it, from both of their life experiences, that is going to get you to think. Remember here at Life is a Sacred Journey, it's always about getting enough knowledge in your goodie grab bag and so you can think about things and so you can question things and you can have that aha moment, right? Get the book, share it with other folks. Before we close out today, uh, Joy and Laura, I want to um, ask you if there's one last thing that you want to share with the Life is, Life is a Sacred Journey audience before we close out. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. What we want to leave women with is that you are empowered. You can fight. You can have a voice. And that no matter what happens to you, to never lose your voice, to always be yourself. And, you know, you're not going to be shut down, not for anyone. You will be believed. So there's a 1-800 number for um, domestic violence siblings out there. It's 1-800-799-7233. I'm going to add it to the suicide hotline that we give you the oh, number to. 1-800-799-7233. Domestic violence is not good. It is a power issue and you have to take back your own power. Your mm -hmm. power to be, be here, to be seen. And so dial that number, put it somewhere, Put remember it if you have to, whatever mm -hmm. you need to do. And whenever that moment, that safety intuition comes up and your gut says, no more, I'm out, peace, mm, dial 1-800-799-7233 so that there are folks out there that can help you navigate this leaving and everything because it's not easy. And so we're not gonna lie to you and tell you that it's easy to leave a, an abuser because yeah. that abuser has gotten used to abusing and they like it. But there are people out there, we can get you to safety, we can get your children to safety and um, get you well on your way to living your best life because you deserve it. You deserve it, okay? All right, friends. And then the other, you always know we end this way. Laura and Joy, um, suicide is one of the major things. Another, uh, you know, I'm involved in a lot of social justice <laughs> stuff, but it's a big one for me. Um, recently, friends, um, uh, I haven't told you this yet, but somebody very close to me, their, uh, their child um, committed suicide. We have been trying so hard to find out what that level of pain was and to, to reach in and support. We weren't able to do it, okay? So there are people out there that are struggling. Mm -hmm. And if you're out there feeling like your life doesn't matter, and even though there are voices telling you they love you because this is what was happening with this young woman, if those voices aren't good enough, don't take your life because their voices aren't, my voice wasn't good enough or somebody else's voice wasn't good enough. Dial 988. They will find somebody that you can connect with and, and you can be well on your way to another day, another second of life where, where we can do better by you. But taking your life is so final. Mm -hmm. And there are so many of us that are grieving this young woman. I've been grieving her 
her loss now for about three weeks. This is the first time I've shared it with you. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I want you to know, and this is a part of all, I'm going to tell you the mm -hmm. stuff in this book mm -hmm. is a part of the reason that she took her life. And you, I'm just going to leave it at that because I, 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 I want to keep this private for the family, but the violence of somebody else made her feel that she was not worthy of love. Mm -hmm. And even when there were a group of us that swooped in and said, we love you, we'll care for you, it wasn't enough, 988. So Joy Farrow and Laura Frumbach are two people who decided to make a change and to be the change in the world. Street Smart Safety for Women, uh, Your Guide to Defensive Living is a book I hope you'll have on your shelf after October 3rd or on your kitchen table or on the little stool next to the toilet. Just saying, I know you read on the toilet. So don't You're the best, Michelle. Yeah, don't, I was going to say, don't act like you don't read on the toilet. <laughs> we all have, and we all do. So <laughs> wherever you need to put that book so you read it from cover to cover, do it. Okay. All right, friends, get out there in the world this weekend. Love somebody, love yourself, uh, pet a cat. And you know, I love dogs the most. So pet them even more and then hug a tree because a tree will teach you and show you that life is a wonderful journey that goes on and on and on. And maybe you'll get a really good vibration from that tree. I hope you do. So go out there, be safe, be defensive, get the book. All right. We love you. Stay, ladies. I want to say goodbye offline. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. And have a great Thank you. Weekend. Thank you.